Amen. Amen. So, we were, uh, we did talk about uh, baptism not too far, not too long ago, uh, when a sister was baptized here, uh, and there was another sister that was baptized a couple weeks prior to that, and again, was getting comments about certain things, about being baptized and whose name and the right name, so kind of went through like an outline of what baptism is and, you know, what does it mean to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to uh, talk again about what baptism is because as we go to Hebrews 1, uh, 6, 1 and 2, it, it describes it as an elementary or uh, a principal doctrine. And I guess we can go there and look at that as we start. <clears throat> Next one says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or completion, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So this, this doctrine of baptism is a, it's a fundamental type of doctrine. It's not something that um, is difficult to really understand. It shouldn't be that difficult for you know young Christians to understand or those that are newly saved, uh, and it shouldn't become an issue to where it's it's becoming difficult to the point to where it's causing confusion and it's causing separation within the body. It shouldn't be doing that because it is an, it is a basic type of principle of doctrine. So it shouldn't be complicated, um, and it when, but it, it ends up being that when it's mixed in with something, when it's mixed in with what we call soteriology or uh, the doctrines of salvation, that's when it becomes, it could become difficult. But is it supposed to be difficult? No. It's supposed to be an elementary type of, of a doc, a doctrine. So, I mean, many people do believe, and we've experienced it on the boardwalk, that um, salvation or being born again, especially when they incorporate it with John 3, uh, where it says you must be born of water, and, you know, that's what it means to be born again. And uh, there's some, some verses here that we're going to go through and we're going to look at that are kind of strongholds that are being held on to in order to in, in order to try to lift that up in, in, in the face and say, yeah, you, you must be you must be baptized uh, with water in order to be saved. That's how that's how one that's how we're washed from sins. That's how we're we're cleansed uh, from sins. And um, but again, we can't take if we look at doctrine as a whole, and we're going to be able to understand doctrine and weigh it in the balance of all scripture that talks about being saved. We can't take one, two, or three verses and then create a doctrine that goes against the majority of doctrines that speak otherwise. So somewhere within these texts that we're going to go through, there has to be a way of finding out what is really being said here, you know. It is, is it, we know Scripture doesn't contradict Scripture. It, it just doesn't. It never will. Um, so we're going to look at some of these things, and we're going to we're going to see what it says. Uh, we're going to go to Acts two thirty eight. First Peter three twenty one, and also Acts twenty two sixteen. We're going to primarily be in the book of Acts and First Peter, but we'll move around a little bit. <clears throat> I'm going to read Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21, and Acts 22.16 uh, right through. So Acts 2.38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. 
Okay, that's one. First Peter three twenty one. says, the like figure were unto even baptism does also now save us, not putting away the, of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of, of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And also Acts 22, 16. Acts 22, 16. Now, this is Ananias talking to Paul as he's been laying down, uh, and Paul is, is, is giving the, uh, the description of what happened during his conversion. And this is Paul's words, uh, speaking in the book of Acts. And 16 says, And now why tarriest thou? This is Ananias talking to Paul. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All right, so these are the three uh, verses we're going to look at because they're stronghold verses for people that want to um, hold on to the, the doctrine that baptism saves, or baptism washes away sins, or baptism, uh, you know, it, it's, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. So we're going to look at Acts 2.38. <clears throat> all these verses are incorporated and attached to water baptism, those that hold to that doctrine. And again, when you attach what Jesus said in John 3, 5 about being born again of water, you can see how easily someone can be swayed into thinking that water baptism saved, uh, saves, especially younger Christians. Uh, over a billion Catholics have brought into this doctrine. A billion. That's a lot of people. But it doesn't matter how many people bought buy into something that's false. If it's false, then it's false. Okay. So can, after, uh, can a billion Catholics be wrong? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're going to see what Scripture teaches. After all, Scripture uh, is the... The final, uh, the final conclusion to what is true, what is not true. Uh, scripture, scripture teaches us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That's 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. So, what teaches us, what tells us, that's profitable for doctrine? Scripture. Scripture tells us these things. So let's go back to Scripture and see what Scripture teaches all about what saves, what washes, what cleanses, what converts the sinner to a saint. Okay, Acts 2.38. We were just there. We're going to read Acts 2.38, but we're going to go to 41. Okay? Acts 2.38 is Peter speaking. Day of Pentecost, preaching. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he preaches the word, calling sinners to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. Verse 40 says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now verse 41, I believe, is key. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 
Praise God. That's a nice harvest for the day. That's a beautiful harvest. So in verse 38, Peter calls them to repent first and then be baptized. Repent first and then be baptized. So in order to be baptized, what had to be there? If, if they're going to baptize, it says that 3,000 3, souls were baptized. What had to be at the place where Peter was preaching? Okay. So water was there, right? So according to vor, uh, verse 41, who were baptized? Amen. They that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, what does the Bible say about receiving the word of God? Wherefore, put away all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to, to save. save your soul. Yeah. Paul tells Timothy to continue in the doctrines that you have learned. For in doing so, in doing so you shall save your souls and, the, and them that hear you. So, again, what saves the soul? It's receiving the word. You must receive the word. John 1.13 says, As many as received him, to them gave he power, which is the Holy Spirit, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay? That's the power. So the key, the key to this is, one, there was water there. In other words, uh, it wasn't like you were going out somewhere and there wasn't water. It was almost like, okay, Peter's calling you to, he's calling for, for the full thing here. You know what I mean? If you're going to believe, you're going to be baptized. Come, step right up. In other words, here's the work that you're going to have to do to prove that you're saved. If there was no water there, there would be no calling to be baptized. That, that is key to know that because they didn't run around in, in other parts of Acts where we're going to read. They, there was no water there. There was no call to be baptized with water. But because it was there, the uh, Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto good works. So that good works, it's the grace of God meeting the faith of man. That's how we're saved. Synergism. And it's unto the good works. We see all three of these present here in Acts 2.38 through 41. It's almost like, here's your receipt. Here's your receipt for your, for your good work. Okay? You're, you're, we're going to do this all today. And it was being done. And it says they were all saved. Um, so... Again, the, the good work was there, and because there was water, Peter called them to it. Now, what would happen if they didn't gladly receive his word? They were in agreement. They weren't going to get in the water. You know? But they were, those that gladly received his word, they were, they were saved before they hit the water. You know, they, it, because it's through belief, we're, and we're going to see that in, in some of these verses that are coming up. So because they were obviously near water, Peter not only called them to repentance, but to demonstrate the repentance and belief of being baptized right there and then. In other words, you say you're, you say you're believing, you're receiving that word of gladness, prove it. Prove it. And they did. You know, 3,000 souls were saved. So in Acts 3, we see Peter and John. Let's go to Acts 3. We're, we're in Acts 2, 38 through 41. So very close, not too far. Acts 3, we see Peter and John going up to the temple, into the temple. They were together. And they see a man and they heal a man. That man was uh, lame from, from birth. He was crippled from birth, from his mother's womb. And Peter starts preaching in verse 12. We're going to read from verse 12 down to 19. It says, And when Peter saw, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why, and this is talking about the miracle that he did. Why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that thou be ignorant, ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Peter says here, not too far away from Acts 2.38, Repent, he says it again, Repent ye therefore, and be what? Converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So the layman in verse 16, which was given perfect soundness through faith, and in whose name? Name of Jesus. He was made whole. I would have to conclude that the man was saved. Okay, the man got saved, born again, because what? He put his faith in Jesus. In verse 19, Peter calls the crowd to repent, just like he did in Acts 2.38, and says that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 16 and 19, there's no mention of what? Water. Well, there's no mention of water. There's no commandment to be baptized, right? Why? Probably no water there. <laughs> I'm thinking there's no water there. You know, uh, where there was water, they probably commanded the people to be baptized too. But here, there's no, there's no water uh, to uh, to baptize them, probably, or maybe there was. Maybe just Peter didn't feel the need to to say that. You know, maybe the Spirit just st stopped him from saying be baptized. Just repent and be converted. Mm. What does converted mean? Born again, right? Yeah, it's to be con it's to be converted. So uh, Peter says the same thing in Acts two thirty eight: repent first, and then be baptized. So that repentance is key because without it, we can't turn from the thing uh, that separates us from God, which is sin. Put our faith in Jesus, which is uh, again turning from the unbelief that we had, which is sin. It's all sin. We have to turn from all that, un understand and be in agreement with God. And then, again, we, we could be baptized after that. I'm not putting down baptism. I don't want to, uh, to, to make baptism something that is not good. No, it's good. We're commanded to do it. It's, it, it if, you're, if you're born again, you need to do it, you know, because God commanded us to Jesus. said, Go ye therefore into all nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So it probably wasn't the time and the place to be baptized in water, but either way, Peter is consistent with the theology of repentance. Consistent in both, in both scriptures. Which brings conversion and the blotting out of sins. Now, to blot uh, means to smear. Okay? Uh, it, it's a Greek word called ex alifo, ex alifo, and it means to smear out or obliterate. Okay, um, and that's what Peter uses this picture in his speech to kind of show people what God will do if you repent. Okay, so when that happens, now the Holy Spirit command you can be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. This is a time where. Someone can be born again. Okay. Now Peter keeps on preaching into chapter four of Acts. Okay, this is this is he keeps on going. And in, in chapter four of Acts, in four four, we read, How be it many of them which heard the word believed? And the number of the men was about five thousand. Okay, 
number of the men was about 5,000. That's a lot of people. They have 3,000 in the chapter before, which has got to be close because chapter 3 starts off with, now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour of prayer. It doesn't say when it was. could have been the next day after the day of Pentecost. We don't know, but it's, it, it, I'm thinking it was fairly close. Okay, so chapter 2 and chapter 3, we see that uh, chapter 2, 3,000 were so, uh, saved. Chapter 4, I'm, gonna, I'm taking it as these people were saved. These people believed, okay? And these 5,000 believed. <clears throat> so according to verses in Acts 3.16 and 3.19, John 1.11 through 13, Acts 2.41, which teaches that repenting, believing, receiving, brings forth salvation. That's what brings forth salvation. Repenting, believing, and receiving, uh, having faith, brings forth salvation. When it's true, can we conclude that the 5,000, people, some people will say, well, it doesn't say that we're saved in verse 4-4. Four, four. It doesn't really say that. And it doesn't. Acts 2.38 says that that 3,000 were saved. Doesn't does, they yeah, it says that they believed. doesn't say that they were added unto them, okay, or added to the church. Um, so can we conclude that? I, I believe that you can conclude that the, the 5,000 were saved because the word believe is the word pistiu, pistiu in Greek. It's the same word which describes the multitude who were filled with the Holy Spirit in the same chapter, Acts 4.31 through 32. So we're in Acts chapter 4.4 4, where it says 5,000 men believed. And in Acts 4.31 and 32, in the same preaching, same day that they went up to the temple, uh, it says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. This is after they got done uh, you know, they got done preaching and were warned and all these things. They went back to the, 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 they came out of the temple, went back to where they were. And it says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. So they were all praying uh, where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And it says, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul and neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So, pistiu means to commit or trust, to entrust, to have faith in something. Okay, and it says, when the multitude of them that believed, it, these were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So the same word that is used there in, in 4.31 is also used in 4.4, speaking about the 5,000. See? So these 5,000, I would say, yeah, they were definitely saved because it says in 4.31 that they that believed were filled with the Holy Ghost. The multitude there was also filled with the Holy Ghost and, the, and shook the place up. Now, what is not mentioned here in 4, 31 and 32? Water is not mentioned. Baptism is not mentioned. So we have 3,000 on one hand that repented. Uh, they received Peter's words with gladness, and then they were baptized. Okay? So we see, we see like, um, chronologically what's going on during baptism. They received Peter's words. In other words, they believed what he said. They entrusted in what he said. And when that happened, then they were baptized. They that received his word with gladness were baptized. And it says that, you know, Acts 2.38 says, <clears throat> And the same day were added unto him about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, think about it. That's, that's over 8,000 people. In a very close period of time, that were saved, that believed, that were entrusted. But yet, you know, the five thousand and the multitude in chapter four, there's no mention of baptism. 
probably because there was, do I think they got baptized? Yeah, I do think they probably got baptized. I believe that, you know, they probably baptized them as probably as quickly as possible. After baptizing 3,000, they might have been a little bit tired. <laughs> Uh, so you got another 5,000 to go. I mean, it's a glorious day. I mean, I could just imagine that day. We rejoice over one or two baptisms. Imagine thousands. That, what a harvest that is. Praise the Lord for that. So, yeah, uh, the, the word piss to you means to commit or trust, to have faith, uh, especially one spiritual. That's according to the Strong's Concordance. Especially one spiritual well-being to Christ. This word, believe, is used to describe the multitude, again, that were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 4.31. So it's, I, I believe it's safe to say that the 5,000 who also believed were also saved. It's not distinguishing between the two groups. So they were saved. Uh, Pisti uh, also means they got saved. Praise God. Praise God for that. But again, what is not mentioned is that they were baptized. That's not mentioned at all. There's no baptism mentioned. Which leads, again, um, to me to think that, again, the way it's worded, they that received his word were gladly baptized. In other words, there was water there. And they just went through what they were commanded to do, and it was convenient to do it. They weren't going to be persecuted, or maybe they would have been persecuted, but in any event, 3,000 souls were, were baptized that day. So turn to First Peter 3.21. And that's what I, I think about Acts 2.38, especially when you're comparing it to Acts 4 and the days preceding. There were many people that were saved and they weren't baptized with water. That's the conclusion. 1 Peter 3.21 I'm going to read 20 and 21. It says, Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism does also now save us, save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of, of, of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here we say we're, we see where actually it says baptism does save us. Okay, But what is it really meaning by that? Let's see what it means. Uh, water baptism here, I, you can see it's being compared to water that flooded the earth in the days of Noah, in which Noah, by faith in what God said, built the ark and were saved from the, the flood of water. Turn to Hebrews 11. Eleven seven. Eleven seven says, oh, let's go eleven six. But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not yet not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became the heir of righteousness which is by faith. So, um, we see here, uh, by faith, uh, Noah was being warned of God, of things that were not yet seen. He didn't experience, there was not even rain back then, no rain, uh, but he moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which uh, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by what? Faith, okay? It says, what was the beginning of 11.7 says? By faith, Noah being warned of God, not in, uh, a God of things not seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So it was by faith in what God said, which saved Noah and his family. So what saved Noah and his family? Faith. Noah's faith saved it. 
Why does Scripture uh, say Noah became the heir of righteousness? By faith, right? Yeah. By faith. Uh, that word faith is a word pistis. Pistis in the Greek. Faith equates to pistis. And believe that we just read about before in the Greek is pistiu. It's kind of a closely related type of word to what is described in Scripture as what saves a person. Okay? That's what saves a person. So when Peter uses the word save us in conjunction with baptism, he uses this word baptism does now save us in conjunction with baptism. He talks about your conscience toward God by doing what God says to do. Okay? I'll say it again. When Peter uses the word he saves us, baptism saves us in conjunction with what he's talking about, baptism. He's talking about your conscience towards God by doing what God says to do. In order to be truly saved, sin would have to be put away, put away for the Holy Spirit to come in. Right? You would have to be purged. You would have to be, your sins would have to be blotted out. Your sins would have to be washed away, and then the Holy Spirit will regenerate you. Peter says that baptism does not put away the filth of the flesh. We read that, okay? The filth of the flesh is what? Sin. Okay? No one gets into the waters of baptism thinking that I'm going to be cleansed from physical dirt. No one does that. You know, you see some of the conditions that people are, are baptized in. Frigid waters, polar waters, uh, traveling great distances to, to have someone baptize, uh, baptize them or doing it in secret, being in persecution when they could just automatically go, go down the street or if they don't have access to a, to a tub or to a shower, they can get clean there. So no one, no one actually goes into the waters of baptism looking to cleanse their physical body. Okay, that's why, that's why Peter says it, it's not the cleansing of the filth of the flesh. Some people will say, well, the filth of the flesh is dirt. No, it's not. The filth of the flesh is sin. Okay? Because no one would go to, to be baptized to, to get clean physically. It's talking about a spiritual cleansing. So water baptism does not cleanse or put away, as Peter says, or wash away the filth of the flesh which is sin, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's, it's doing what God commanded us to do. It's not, the saving of, it's not the saving of the soul. It's not purging out sin. It has no power to do that. Okay? Our, our, our sins, our sins if, if you're going to be saved, you hear the gospel and you believe the gospel... Uh, if you're on a campus and you're preaching the gospel and the person believes and cries out to God and asks the Lord to save them, he's going to save them. It, it's not, it's not going to wait until that, the, the, the foot goes into the baptism of water. That's not when we get cleansed. Mm -mm. It's by faith. We see this. I mean, the whole chapter of, of Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith said they obtained a better resurrection. So it, everything is by faith. Everything is through belief. These two words that are in conjunction of, of what really saves the soul. So uh, it's an answer to God with a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Should you be baptized? Absolutely. If you haven't been baptized, get baptized. Okay, be baptized because you're commanded to do it. Uh, four, James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Okay? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Uh, so if we're instructed to be baptized after, after becoming saved, born again, we do it because the Lord commands it. Okay, uh, and our conscience commands us 
towards God to obey his commandments. Go to 1 John 3. First John three twenty one. Uh, three three twenty, I'm sorry, three twenty and twenty one. <clears throat> John says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. What happens when your heart condemns you? Conscience is saying there's something wrong. You know, there's something wrong going on here. It says, Beloved, but if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. In other words, we know we're walking in the light with God. If he says to do something, I don't care if it's baptism, I don't care what it is, and he's called you to do it, if we don't listen to that calling, are we going to have a right conscience with God? No. no. Now, the Bible says, For we are created... We are his workmanship created unto good works. Those good works, God is going to minister in your life as, a, as an individual Christian, and those things have to be worked out. That's why the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We have to do what God says. You know, not as something that, okay, do it. No, it's out of love. This is, this is worked out of, of love for God. If we love God, we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And these commandments that he tells us to do are not grievous. If some, if, if Jesus specifically said that we are to be baptized uh, after, you know, to, to, after we're, uh, we repent and we believe. He, he commands uh, that, that we should be baptized. If someone is unwilling to do that, that's not, that, that's, there's something wrong there, you know. Uh, there's something wrong there. But the point of the matter comes of when is the person saved? Is the person saved at the moment they repent and they believe, as it says in Acts 4, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit? Or is it after they get in the water? Once they repent and believe. Once they repent and believe, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think it's, uh, we're showing that here in these scriptures. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is believing, it is faith that saves a person. Uh, praise the Lord. Peter says that baptism does not put away the filth of the flesh. The filth of the flesh is sin. Mm -hmm. James 14 talks about this heart, which is our conscience, and uh, we need to do what God says. Otherwise, we're going to be unsettled in that. So if we're instructed to be baptized after becoming saved, born again, we do it because the Lord commands it. That's why we do it. And he's our Lord. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not the things? In other words, he's not our Lord if we don't do it. And we should do it willingly. We should, it should be a day of, of, of celebrating, glorious day, as, as it shows and it brings glory to Jesus of what has already been done in someone's heart by the Holy Spirit, as we've seen in Galatians 3.27. It's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us with himself, right? The Holy Spirit is the one that baptizes us into the body of Christ. He ushers us into the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. and we spoke about that last time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, yeah, John talks about that, about having a, a heart that is right with God and conscience being right. So if baptism doesn't put away sin, which is the filth of the flesh, what is Acts 22.16 saying? Go back to Acts Acts 22:16. And now why tarriest thou, Paul, will rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? All right. After seeing in 1 Peter 3:21 that baptism does not put away sin, this scripture is not going to contradict that scripture. Okay, we have to come to that conclusion right away. So there has to be an alternative meaning to what this scripture is actually saying. Okay, um, 
Ananias is simply commanding Paul to be baptized and the washing away of Paul's sins would be when he's what? Calling on the name of the Lord to obviously save him. That, that's, that's, what's lastly say, that's what lastly is being said. Now why tirest thou? Arise and be baptized. And wash away, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Okay, so we have to understand the sequence of how it's being done. The washing away of the sins is consistent with the rest of Scripture that talks about calling upon the name of the Lord. Paul gives us more insight to what he said in Acts 22.16, okay, uh, and in his epistle to his church at Rome. So go to Romans 10, because Paul's using the same language here somewhat. Romans 10, 9 through 13. I'm going to read it. That if thou shalt confess, that word confess means be in agreement with God. The, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, agreed who the Lord Jesus is, agree with God why he came, why he sent him, and shall believe, there's that word again, believe, in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. There's that word again, believeth. It's the same word, pissed at you. Believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession, agreement with God, is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no, we see there again the word believeth. It's in capital, all caps. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse 13 lines right up with Acts 22:16. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. Praise God. Paul defines the theology of, of, of how a person is saved in Romans 10, 9 through 12, through 13. And, and it incorporates the last part in, in, of Acts where Paul is describing what happened to him as he met up with Ananias. Okay? For whosoever and whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Paul experienced this when he was with Ananias. And Ananias touched him, and he received his sight. But Paul was calling upon the name of the Lord in Acts 22, 16. And he was saved, obviously, because this is what he's teaching in Romans as the theology through his experience. Not only because he constantly gives his experience of being saved, being knocked, up, knocked down to the ground, of being blinded, this is constant through the book of Acts as he's, as he's speaking and giving his testimony. And uh, we, we see his theology being penned down in Romans 10, 9 through 13, which is really key. I think it's really key. And what don't we see here? We don't see water. We don't see any mention of water. This is not an experience that Paul's teaching in Romans 10, 9. He's teaching theology here. He's teaching soteriology. He's speaking how someone becomes saved. That's what he's saying. This is not like where Paul's, on his, Paul's going through Damascus and he's, he's giving his testimony. This, he's teaching doctrine here in Romans 10. This is, this is later on down the road after Acts 22. This is after all these, he's experienced all these things and the Holy Spirit's ministering unto him and he's able to, to, to hone this in and... and uh, you know, give it to us about how a person is to be saved. And there's no mention of baptism. And I believe that he wrote these Romans 10, 9 through 13 down, putting verse 13 there explicitly to draw you back to, to Acts 22, 16. And he's, and he's basically uh, overthrowing the baptism thing. As we see, the baptism would, would eventually, you're going to be baptized, he was baptized. 
Okay, so we, we see that. Uh, when you read this section of Scripture, you can clearly see that the Apostle Paul uh, reveals how a person is saved, without a doubt. Believing in God, uh, concerning Jesus, obeying Jesus, and calling upon Him to wash, cleanse us, to blot out, and to give us His Spirit when someone calls upon, you, calls upon Him. Jesus said, what man, uh, asking the Father of the Holy Spirit, would He not give it? He's going to give you the Holy Spirit, but it has to be when you're calling upon Him in that moment where you're broken, you know you need Him. I mean, Paul was blinded. He didn't eat. He didn't drink for three days. The Bible, uh, Paul, uh, the, uh, Jesus told Ananias to go to Paul because he prayeth. While he was blind, while he was, uh, while he was not drinking, while he was not eating, he was praying. That, that's, what the, that's what the Lord Jesus said. And as he was giving Ananias his his commandment to go and lay his hands upon him and tell him great things that he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul uses the same language he used in Acts 22.16 about calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. What's not mentioned in Romans 10.9-13? Water baptism. Okay, Water baptism is nowhere to be found. And that's the theology that... that you know, is consistent throughout the Bible. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1.17. 1 I'm going to read through 21. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 1.17 through 21. This is Paul. Paul speaking again. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved or being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto Greeks foolishness. I went up to 23 there, but... Um, but it's the preaching of the cross, okay, which saves. It is the power of God. That's the power of God. If it was something that, that Paul was, uh, it was a necessity for salvation, Paul would have been preaching baptism. You know, but he said, I come not to baptize. I come not to do those things. Uh, Paul says in, in verse 121, Paul says, uh, that it pleases God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that what? Believe. Okay? He's, he's, he's making a, a, distinct, a distinct distinction between being saved and being baptized. You see that, right? It's the gospel. It's the preaching that saves the soul. It's, it's receiving the word with meekness that saves the soul. It's receiving Christ as it says in John 1.13, that saves the person, that gives us the power of God, which we're born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but they're born of God. This is how we're born again. This is, this is how a person is born again. This is how a person is, is saved. It, it's not through uh, going into the waters of baptism. And again, I don't want to diminish the, the necessity for baptism because it needs to be done. God commanded us to do it. Anything He commands us to do, we need to do it. If not, our conscience is not going to sit right with us. So, um, yeah, just to, just to, I think 117 through 21 is, is really powerful in showing that Paul was the, uh, the apostle unto the Gentiles, and, and the preaching of the cross is what saves the soul. It's the preaching of Scripture, the Word of God, which saves the soul. And it's definitely not, it's not baptizing people with water. Um, that's it, it, there's a, a clear distinction there in 117 through 21.
but there are multitudes of scripture. I only went through a couple here. We stayed pretty pretty close. I mean, we did go to Romans 10, 9 through 13, but there are multitudes of scriptures that speak about what saves, okay, by faith. Consistently, it's faith. It's receiving Jesus. It's it's by believing on the Lord Jesus. It's by repenting. Repenting, you know, people want to say repenting is just a change of the mind. Yeah, okay, it is a change of the mind, but what are you changing your mind about? Sin. You're changing your mind about sin, about God. Uh, you know, repentance incorporates everything. It's abhorring sin. It gives, it gives that, that description of actually hating sin, um, but it also incorporates you know, turning to God, too. It, it's, it's everything. It's turning from the, the sin of unbelief to the sin of belief. So repentance is wrapped up with everything to do with salvation. And in a lot of these verses, even in Acts 2.38, Peter starts off with repent. Acts 3.19, repent. That's all encompassing with, with, with salvation. Jesus said repent, and then he said believe the gospel. Okay, the death, burial, and resurrection of himself for the remission of sins. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the preaching of the cross. It's the preaching of God's word, which pleases God to, to save the soul. Um, and, and that's what we have to understand. We have to uh, understand that. I'm sure you guys all know this, um, but there's many people that are caught up in, in this, this doctrine of, of believing that water actually saves or cleanses from sin. There's too many, too many verses that talks about we're cleansed from sin, from the blood. Mm -hmm. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, with, uh, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from what? Mm -hmm. All sin. Okay, it's the blood. Like, there's, just, there's so many verses, and I, I encourage you to look up these things if, if you're on YouTube and you're, you've been thought to thinking that uh, I've been saved because I've been baptized. I've been born again because I've been baptized. Look into these verses. Study. Ask, ask God to show, uh, show you and ask the, the Spirit to teach you. And He will guide you and show you that there's nothing that we can do. You know, you talk about, just one more thing. Uh, Acts 2.38, when you go to Acts 2.38, I mean, people want to uh, build a, a doctrine upon uh, being water baptized. But in Acts 2.38... In 239 through 41, 240, Peter says within that, that uh, those couple texts, he says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Now there is scripture that, that Paul talks about to Timothy about saving himself uh, by sticking with the doctrine that he's learned. Okay, do we teach a doctrine that we save ourselves just because it says it in Scripture? No. Can we save ourselves? No. Obviously we can't. I'm not going to start preaching and, and believing a doctrine that, yes, I can save myself. Without the Lord Jesus, there is no salvation. Without the, without the grace of God, there is no salvation. Okay, now God allows us through grace to be saved through our faith. Okay, that is the gift of God. It's, it's not a work. Not that we can do something to save it, uh, but it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There would be no bragging in heaven. None. So, um, all glory to Jesus Christ. And I think breaking down these verses and, and going a little bit further and looking a little bit further and seeing what it says about the 5,000 that were saved and or 5,000 that believed, and understanding that, yes, they, they were believers too, besides the 3,000 that were baptized, but these 5,000 never got baptized. Easy to see that baptism was not even preached, only because probably there was water there that day. Praise God? Amen. 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 Anybody have any add on to it? Acts 22. 2216? Yeah. I was thinking of things that went when Paul says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, wash away these things from the name of the Lord. Wasn't there also mentioned too, like John, like, uh, you know, I baptize you in water, but there would be someone uh, that will baptize you with fire? So, that, 
the thing like baptism is like also like uh, the Holy Spirit too. So, well, yeah, well, the word baptism in different forms. Maybe? Well, there's different baptisms in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. you, you basically have three. You have the baptism of John, you have the baptism of Jesus, and then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We talked about that in, in not too long ago, but um, John's came first. Mm -hmm. It was a baptism unto repentance. You know, it, it was it was getting right with God, having that clean conscience, and proving it by being baptized. It wasn't the water yeah. that made them right with God. It was them, their willful heart uh, to come and, 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 to, and to cry out to be saved through repentance. It was the baptism of repentance and then proving that by the baptism. Mm -hmm. um, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we spoke about last time, which was uh, I in, and I think, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and also Galatians 3, 27, that's when, the, that's when the Holy Spirit actually baptizes us into that universal body of Christ. Not, it's not, it, you know what I mean? It's that universal church uh, of, of believers. But that comes through the, the Holy Spirit, and then we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're not bap Nobody's baptized in the name of John then, but then they were kind of dealing with that dilemma. Mm. So that's where you have the two names, uh, you know, in the name of John's baptism or, or the name of Jesus, where... That's also confusion, too, because there's many that fight about that. You weren't baptized in the name of Jesus. You weren't baptized right. You know, you need to be, and, and then, but Jesus tells us we need to be, and to be baptized in the name of Jesus, you'd be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit because he represents all three. Mm -hmm. You know, so praise God for uh, Scripture, which this is where we get our doctrine from, folks. If we didn't have this to go through, and I know it's, it can be difficult to go through when you look at all these things, but it's clear as a bell. Salvation comes through faith. Everything stems from faith. God has all the grace. He's been giving us so much grace. We just got to come with the faith. Mm. You know, if we, if the Bible says that in the last days, what, uh, you know, some will depart from the faith. Mm -hmm. So we still, we still have faith. We still have the, 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 you know, the free will to depart from that faith. That was, you know, it's continuing. Uh, we, we see that even now that many people they depart from the faith, um, which is a, that's a shame. It's horrible to see, but it, it's it's a reality, you know. Um, so yeah, do praise think, the Lord. Do you think, brother, like um, say remember when Cornelius and his family they were saved filled with the Holy Spirit right. before they were baptized? Right. But they did they get baptized then too? Remember? Uh, let's go. Let's go to so it. I'm just trying to figure out. I know where you said where you think when everything was done all together, they repented, they believed, and then they were water baptized. Do you think that there was water present at that situation every time where we see all three together? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would imagine because it's a scenario that's happening there. It's not. It's not theology that's Paul. Paul is teaching later on in, yeah. in Scripture. It's. It's. It's the acts. It's you know. It's what that was. That would be a great thing to bring up. Yeah, every, absolutely. Every time they talk about it all happening, it's right. because there was water, right? Right, there. absolutely. So what was that chapter? Do you remember with Cornelius? I think it was Acts chapter um, eleven. Acts chapter ten. Acts ten um, forty-four through forty-eight. It says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on, on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed, so I guess we would say that those of the circumcision were saved, right? Were astonished, and that as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also were poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which shall receive the Holy Ghost as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then pray they, they prayed that they him to tarry certain days. So yeah, here we see again that, you know, the Holy Ghost. So must have been water present? Yeah, or? yeah. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. in Cornelius' house, right? Well, Cornelius came to, to Peter. Um, and this is, if we look in... in Look in uh, chapter 9, 43, it's, and 42, it says Peter was staying in Joppa. And, and Joppa, 
when you go into Jerusalem, it's, n it's near Tel Aviv, but it's right along the sea. So there's plenty of water there. When we went to Jerusalem, uh, Kerrigan was actually going uh, back and forth to Joppa because there's a, there's a, uh, a, uh, a church in Peter's name, uh, St. Peter's or something there, that supposedly that's where he stayed when he stayed here. This is where all this took place. Um, so yeah, Peter, where this was, um, there was, you know, the seas there. You know, they were probably baptized them right there in the sea. So um, yeah, you see where water is convenient. That's they did baptize, you know, and rightfully so. They're just doing what the Lord said, right? Yeah. Um, but again, the Holy Ghost came on them when, prior to being baptized. Okay, prior to being baptized. And also, um, if you look at the uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. yeah, water. yeah, they're you know. Yeah, water. Yeah. yeah, the Ethiopian eunuch said, "What, what would stop me from being baptized?" And what did Philip say? Mm -hmm. Thou believes with all thy heart. And he said, "Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God." And he went down and he baptized him. Mm -hmm. It's it's belie it's believing on on him. You know, it's and it's not just okay. Yeah, I believe. In, it's it's that it's that true belief. And, you know, it says the Spirit caught up Philip and took him away from there, and he's seen him no more. So he didn't have time to disciple him. He didn't have time to do uh, any of these things. But, no, he just baptized him. And In other words, when he baptized him, and, and prior to being baptized, he, was, he believed. It doesn't say that he was the, the, the Holy Ghost came upon him or anything, but um, he had to be. The Holy Ghost had to come on him. The Holy Spirit had to come on him. And once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, now you have the teacher. I mean, the Ethiopian and eunuch was reading Isaiah 53. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, um, yeah, I mean, we see where, even, even we see the Ethiopian eunuch being worked on, getting stirred up, and, and understanding who the Messiah is, and, you know, Philip just leading him and saying a couple words, yeah, this, and he preached him Jesus, you know. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah. That's definitely kind of, you know, because I think the Baptist would use that as like, see, you don't need to preach them, you can just believe. Right, right. Uh, uh, that's happened too, it's like something when the lab door is over someone. Right, right. Yeah, well, they, they don't understand the word believe to really what it really means. Mm. You know, uh, believe means to, it's a continual action. In other words, it's not just a mindset. It's it's entrusting, it's, it's faith, it's... It's that whole encompassing thing that it, there's a transfer of whatever you thought before, you don't think that anymore. Or it, that's what it's encompassing. And that all comes through repentance yeah. because you have to change your mind in order to believe, you know. And it's that, that repentance which incorporates faith, incorporates belief. It also incorporates the departing of what, what's separating you from God, from God right now. You know, and I'm turning from that, and I'm believing everything. That, again, it's all encompassing within the realm of metanoia, which is which is um, repentance. But so. I think, like in that testimony, I don't think repentance was mentioned, though. Right? It was just he said belief. So. Yeah. Yeah. But so it, I think if you're witnessing something, you gotta explain that. I yeah. Think he says in that. Did he? You remember the verses? I think he said when he saw him. Uh, so I think he was teaching. Yeah, we can do that. Do you remember that verse? Someone want to read it? Do you want to read it, though? Oh, 26, um, Yeah, it says 26 and 40. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go uh, toward the south along the road, which was which goes down to from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charged of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship.
worship was a praying to the name of Kerith, was named Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, saying, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? I asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place of the, uh, the place in the scripture which he reads was this. It was led as a shepherd to his daughter, as a lamb before his chair was found. They opened not his mouth, and his humiliation his justice was spoken among us. And he will declare his generation, and his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, whom does the prophet say this? Is him or is some other man? Uh, sorry. Uh, then Philip opened his mouth. And the beginning of the scripture preached here to him. Preached to him. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, as they mm-hmm. went down the road, they came to the water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, To believe with all your heart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He said, and Sorry, he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, baptizing. Mm-hmm. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So the son of Sidus, and passing through, was preached uh, in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So, oh, okay. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. But now we also see now that this brings up another question here. Right. So when Philip preached Jesus, he obviously touched on water back then. Mm-hmm. So he said something about it. Yep. Because the Ethiopian leaders wouldn't have known that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he really took, he really preached Jesus. Right. So he sat with him for a while, obviously, right? Yeah. Wow. So when you see from 35 to 36, it's only one scripture away, right? But how much did Philip yeah. preach on? He could right? have been there for an hour and a he half. Could have been there for a while. You know, yeah. we just don't know. And yeah. that's what's the beauty about scripture, because we can only speculate about what Philip was preaching when he was preaching unto him Jesus. Yeah. But I'm sure the commandment to be baptized was there. <laughs> yeah. He just spent a whole day with them, yeah. right? Yeah. But he made sure uh, of, uh, you know, and Philip, if thou believest with all thine heart, yeah. you know, everything that you got, you know. So praise the Lord. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, you know. Can you imagine that scene? You know, this this guy was in charge of a lot of things from the Queen, you know. Uh it's amazing. Hard to see that nowadays with people just pulling far away. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm.